next session. We want to begin, uh, we want to continue on with um, the five great commission commandments of our Lord and King. And we want to continue with commission number five. And what I'm doing here is I'm combining the letters of Luke to a friend, Theopolis. He wrote a letter to one person. The Lord dealt with me a few years back and he said, was I, was I willing to write and minister to an audience of one? And then trust God to do whatever God wants to do with that testimony. And I, he brought me to this book. So he writes to an audience of one man. Now, maybe billions of people have read the books. But that when he wrote it, he wrote it out of the context of his relationship. And so much of what we read in the New Testament, whether it's the book of Timothy, we must read Timothy, which was a letter from a father in the faith to a son. We must read uh, the letter in the context of the relationship by which it was written. If we don't read the content in the context of the relationship, we come up with religion. And that's all we have, because we don't have relationship. So, please remember, Paul, uh, Luke is writing to a good friend, someone he loves. And so he's, he's writing to him the best he can. And, and I think it's important to put the two together and to consider exactly what might be the differences. So I want to open up uh, the book of Acts, and I want to begin... By reading Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Okay, I want to begin by reading Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Now, it says here, The former account, or book, I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Right off the bat, Jesus gave commandments to those he had chosen. I think it's important for us to get a hold of that. And then it starts in verse 3. In verse 3, he says, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, with the different versions that are in the room, the different versions of the Bible, does anybody have a, a content of conversation with Jesus that has anything to do with anything other than the kingdom of God. Does everybody's version talk about him spending 40 days talking about the kingdom of God? King James? Passion? Hebraic? What, have, what do you have? Living way? Living. Living. Yeah. You guys are all King James people too. So this is what he talked about. For 40 days. Not once. Now see, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it says, like we just read Matt, uh, Luke, we just finished Luke. It says he opened their understanding, and he, he, that they had comprehended the scriptures, and then it says, and they went out and left. And it sounds like he did one thing one night, and the next day he's gone. But the opening of the scriptures took over 40 days. And he walked with them and he revealed himself and he did many signs and wonders. Many things, infallible proofs. As Jesus returned and spoke to his disciples about the kingdom of God. Not how to have a church service. Not how to build buildings or build organizations. He talked to them about the kingdom of God. Now, I call this, and this is my own little thing, you don't have to agree with me, and please don't get all upset with me. Okay? I believe 
there are 40 days of awe. A W E. I believe for 40 days, the resurrected living God showed himself in all kinds of things from Galilee up there to 500 people down there to these people over here. And, to the, and he continually revealed himself. I believe, you don't have to agree with, I believe he went back to every single one that he had spoken to during his life and he showed himself alive in every place. I believe he so cared for the people. He came back to Bethany. He came back to Nazareth. He walked back and he revealed himself for 40 days. Now a handful of those things are recorded. A handful, a few things were recorded. But he spent 40 days of awe and the people were just in awe of him. They were filled with awe and wonder and fear and oh my goodness. And it was during these times, during this time, that he would have retaken, he would have explained to his disciples all that had been accomplished beyond their sight and beyond their senses. It says he opened up their understanding that they could comprehend the scripture. So he went through Moses, he went through the prophets, he went through the Psalms, he went through it all and he explained, this is why. This is what happened when the stripes came. This is what happened when that came. When they pulled out the beard. It was Isaiah 50, verse 9, verse 6. And when this happened, it was that. And when this happened, it was that. And when this happened, it was that. And this and this and this and this and this. And he just walked through the whole thing for 40 days. Imagine the awe of seeing this one. And then he would have taken the time to say, this is what happened at the trial. This is what happened in the betrayal. This is why I had to be betrayed by Judas. This is why Zechariah uh, prophesied this uh, 900 years in advance. It would be 30 pieces of silver and it would be put down and bought a, a field, a, a, a potter's field, and they did exactly that. See, he went through the whole thing. Every single item. Every single note. It was all scripted and prescribed by God from before the beginning of the foundation of the earth for our redemption. For us, who would be called by his name. And he would have taken the time. He would have taken the time to come back to blind Bartimaeus. And said, blind Bartimaeus, it wasn't enough that I healed you. You followed me to the cross and you saw love. He would have gone to each and every one, I believe. Because God so loved the world. He wanted a testimony that could stand. I believe Jesus explained what had happened to him after the woman had seen him earlier in the day. Remember that? We'll talk about it next week. Get ready for a ride. He said, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended to my Father in heaven. He comes back a few hours later and he says, touch me. Give me something to eat. What happened? He would have explained what happened. The writer of Hebrews talked about it later. Others read about it. It would have all been as a part of the fulfillment of what had been written in Moses, in the law, in the prophets, in the Psalms, in the, in the Passover. Everything was fulfilled in this man named Jesus of Nazareth who became the Christ. He would have explained what happened to him when he was in the tomb. What happened to him when he went into death. Peter didn't make that up. Jesus explained what happened to when he became your sin and my sin. What happened when he who knew no sin became sin and so putrid that God just, the, the, the forsaken, that he was forsaken that we might be received. But then later he is able to approach in the throne of God and come down to the altar of God with his own blood. What happened to that blood that had been made impure and was filled with sin, sin, sin? Everyone's sin, everyone's sickness, everyone's disease, every cancer. He took it all. And he would have explained that. He would have talked to them and their hearts would have been burned. It wouldn't have been just the two in the road to Emmaus. I'm telling you, everywhere he went, he would have set fires ablaze, hearts ablaze. 
No wonder they turned the world upside down. It wasn't just a handful. It was all of them. Everyone going everywhere, doing everything all the time because they had encountered this living God. It would explain how everything had been scripted and prescribed by God from before the beginning of the foundation of the earth. He would have said, touch me. Put your finger here. It's okay. You know, he never criticized Thomas, my friends. He said, Thomas, he came back. He didn't beat up. He said, have peace. He had, he had a whole meeting, an encounter meeting, a presence meeting. And he, he said hi to the guys. And he said, peace to you. And then he walks right over and says, Thomas, I'm here for you. Thomas, I'm here for you. Touch me. Feel me. Take a look. And he would have exposed himself. And God will do the same thing for us today. He'll have a special encounter meeting. If we can believe him, he'll come and he'll say peace to the whole group. And then there'll be one. He'll say, I want to show you something about me. You want to see me? And the whole meeting will be all about that one person. See, God so cares. Oh, my friends. He commanded them not to depart. Again, a command. Commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem until they had received this power, baptized with the Holy Spirit. He had spoken about it for a long time. Now it was time. So it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 8. Therefore, when they come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I find this a little humorous. But you know what? I am so glad this is in there. I am so glad that after three years of listening to him, watching him, and going through him, and then a 40-day intensive with the resurrected Christ, they still didn't get it. I'm so glad this is in there. I'm so glad they didn't understand the whole package. Even after a 40-day extensive study and encounterability of a living God. Oh, my goodness. 40 days of all. Could you imagine? Then you get to the end of it. You're, he's getting ready to leave it. You ask a stupid question. It wasn't a stupid question. Though. It was a question of the heart. And guess what? God doesn't beat him up. Jesus doesn't beat him up. He doesn't say, oh, you stupid. Don't say things like that. Get those... Get those things out of your mouth. He said to them, It's not for you to know the times of season, times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. A, it's interesting. In, in my New King James, it says times or seasons. There's a difference. There are seasons and there's times of seasons. How many of you know we're in early spring right now? We're in, we're in late winter. You could say late winter, but actually we, we're in the spring. We're in early spring, though. We're not in mid-spring. We're not in late spring. We're not in summer. We're in early spring. We're in the time of a season. We need to learn how to discern the times of the seasons in which we live. Two days ago, the President of the United States signed a document recognizing the right of Israel to have authority and to be the legal property of the West Bank. So what season is that? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, I don't want to get in a big tiff. I don't want to get in a big tiff, but he says, and of the earth in mine. Okay? Now, now the earth to me is that which we stand upon. The world is a system of philosophy and thought. The earth is that which we stand upon and we live. It's the dirt. Okay, And when he says the end, I'm glad that in my version anyway, and I, anybody, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to ask you another question. Does anybody have the word ends with a plural 
Anybody? King James. Huh? Uttermost. That's good. We'll work with that. Anybody else? Back there, the passion. What does it say? The remote, what, say it again? Remotest. Remotest part of the earth, okay? What does yours say? The living. What? Ends with an S. Ends with an S. Okay, so I don't want to get in a big argument. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you in a minute why I believe it's the end of the earth. So we're going to talk about that. I think in verse 6, we talked about the fact that they didn't understand after 40 days. And I'm so glad because I don't understand after 46 years. I still don't get it. I don't have it all put together. And uh, this, uh, Jesus did not say that the nation of Israel would not be restored, only that the timing was under the Father's own authority. And on May 14, 1948, Father indeed restored the nation state of Israel to the land. He restored the land to the people. And he restored the Hebrew language to the people. Such a thing has never happened in the history of humanity. In the history of humanity, what, took, what has taken place has never happened in any other situation. And at the last, we'll talk about a prophetic generation in the last quarter of this study. And we'll discuss this a lot. But the land to the people. And then the people to the land. And then the language to them both. People and the land was an ancient language. Hardly anybody spoke it. It's never happened before. But it has now. We have an example of God's faithfulness. The fact that there is a, a blue and white flag, uh, the Hebraic flag, uh, the fact that we have that is an evidence of God's faithfulness to watch over His Word to perform it. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit being resident within the life and being of the disciples in this life, is promised in many places. In the, in the preaching and teaching of Jesus of Nazareth, the Paschal Lamb of God. But perhaps there is nowhere, there is nowhere that it is so poignant as here in Acts, as Jesus prepares to ascend once again to be reunited with his father for the remaining duration of the age. Jesus is preparing a people to prepare the world for the day he will return. But Jesus had foreknowledge of the fulfillment of prophecy that would take place during the festival of Pentecost only seven days away. Seven days, one week was going to pass and the day of Pentecost would come. Now the day of Pentecost, there would be a continuing fulfillment of the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms on the day of Pentecost. To this very hour, the scriptures of law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms continue to reveal God's heart, purposes for the nation of Israel and his precious, precious people, the church of Jesus Christ. The ministry of presence would be inaugurated as the Holy Spirit would take up residence within redeemed humanity on the day of Pentecost. I wish I could leave this here. Because what happened on the day of Pentecost is a redeemed humanity. A redeemed humanity of people who believed in the resurrected Christ. They believed in the fulfillment. They repented. They, everything they needed. They were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They were redeemed. They were redeemed. And they were praying. And as they stood there, knelt there, laid there, the Holy Spirit came down and dwelt within them. The Holy Spirit came down 
and dwelt within a redeemed humanity. And it made, it made a new creature. A new creature that had never appeared on the planet Earth at any time in previous history. A people redeemed and purchased by the blood of Jesus, shed in the garden upon the cross. The blood which Jesus is the Lamb of Christ and Christ of God would place upon a heavenly altar to seal the covenant between Himself and the Father. Pentecost was the celebration of the day when God provided Israel with the commandments of His character for them to follow. That's what, that's what Pentecost is all about. It's the celebration of the presentation of the Ten Commandments. But I, I, I would say to you, I would venture to say to you that they are the ten references of the character of God. God doesn't lie, so you don't lie. God doesn't covet, so you don't covet. You're going to be like me. You're going to be my people. They're not rules and regulations, my friend. They're an expression of the heart of God. This is who I am. And you're going to be my people. You will be like me. But now, they would now celebrate by the presence of God's law being written within upon the tablets of the hearts of those who believed. It had been written on the law, on the tablets of stone. And they could be among the people and they would say, this is the character of God, imitate Him. But now the law was coming within and the, tab, the finger was God writing on the tablets of the hearts of men and now they could be imitators of Christ. Being made perfect even as He is perfect. Be holy even as He is holy. On Mount Zion, Zionai, God provided mankind with His law in a written format. The alphabet by which it was written and the cognitive literacy ability to read and write was downloaded. There was no alphabet before the Ten Commandments. These people came out as slaves out from Egypt 400 years they didn't know how to read. They didn't know how to write. All they had in Egypt were, this, were these uh, hieroglyphics. They had no alphabet. But God put it on stones. And He wrote it with letters. And then He gave to them the capacity to understand, read, articulate, and write. He gave them literacy in addition to the law because he says later write them on the post of your tents it would not have been reasonable for them to be commanded to write if they hadn't been given the gift of ability to write see Jesus knew Jesus absolutely knew that a new creation, a new creature, a new culture, a new civilization was about to appear upon the earth for the first time since the beginning of the age. It's not about us coming and getting saved and dying and going to heaven. It's about bringing heaven and a new creation to earth, redeeming the earth. Making the earth new. Jesus knew the next age, a new age, was about to be unfurled for all of creation to behold. That's why powers and principalities are watching us to see the manifold wisdom of God is true in Christ Jesus from before the beginning of the foundation of the earth. They're all watching us. No wonder the angels knew what he said. They're watching. There is a new age, my friends. But it's not a new age movement out of this foulness and filthiness and imitation that the world wants to offer. There's a new age in God to bring his life, Christos, anointing of God down to a people redeemed by the blood of the Lamb to make a new creature, to make a new culture, to make a new creation, a new civilization, and to disciple the nations 
to be like heaven. During this age, he will be in heaven, enthroned with his Father, and the Holy Spirit would be upon the earth and within his precious purchased people, his church. This is what's going on. This is where we are right now. This is who we are. This is what we are. Now, I want to talk about this little issue where we're at here. I'm going to, I'm going to try to leave this. It's just so you can see it. There's, I want to talk about the word literacy. Literacy. Let me get the right spelling in literacy. Okay. Now, a broad interpretation sees literacy as knowledge and competence in a specific area or arena of activity. Now, if you ask somebody about literacy, they will, right off the bat, they'll say, oh, they can read and write. But if you have, if you are literacy in bookkeeping or, or taxes, if you, are literate, if you are literate in how to take apart that engine and replace the pieces, you are literate in an ability of talent and in competence in a specific area or arena of activity. You see what I'm saying? In a broader sense than just reading and writing. Are you following me? Literacy is more. Literacy is more than just reading and writing. It's the capacity to comprehend, to understand, to excel, to be able to activate, use something. We are learning kingdom competency and literacy at this time in history. God is redeeming and restoring the gospel of the kingdom of God and he's teaching us how to be competent in the things that he's given to us, the tools, the gifts, and how to have literacy, how to speak, how to even talk about these things. We don't know how. We have a church that has been robbed and stolen by Catholics and other religious people taking away the traditions of men have made the word of God of no effect. We don't even know how to talk about the kingdom. We're not literate at all. My friends, we are not only biblically illiterate as a church, we are kingdom illiterate as a people. And that is what God is changing right now on the planet Earth. He's giving to us not only the knowledge of the kingdom, like He did on the day at Mount Sinai. He's giving us the language. He's giving us a competency. He's giving us a literacy. So I know how to lay hands on the sick. I know how to speak to demons. I know how to walk on the water. I know how to do these things. I am competent. And I am literate in the things of the kingdom of God, and I can do it. That's what competency. Somebody calls you up and says, can you take that machine and do this and that and that? You say, yes, sir, I can do it. Can I give you that set of books and can you balance that? You said, yes, sir, I can do it. I am competent. Are we competent in the things of the kingdom of God? Well, I'm telling you what, God is making us competent. He has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance in the saints by the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. First uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 to 14. The concept of literacy has evolved in meaning. Modern terms meaning has been expanded to include the ability to use language, numbers, images, computers, and other basic means to understand, communicate, gain useful knowledge, solve problems, and use symbolic systems of a culture. See, I might be able to speak well in English, but if you take me to Korea and I'm sitting in Seoul, Korea, I don't have a clue how to speak in Korean. If you drop me down in a country like Egypt, and I'm sitting there, I'm in a village somewhere outside of Cairo. In Cairo, I could probably find somebody to speak English, but if I'm in a little village... I probably couldn't even find anybody to help me. I probably would, I'd be illiterate. I'd be in trouble. I wouldn't know how to ask for the bathroom. You understand what I'm saying? Literacy is more. The next stage was a new age for mankind and for creation. This new creature in Christ Jesus was to be on display. I'm telling you, I don't think you understand. I don't think we understand. Here these people are. 
redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The Holy Spirit comes to us. There's fire. There's, there's wind. There's shaking. The whole of creation was watching. The whole of creation in the heavens and below. He has a name above every other name. Every name in heaven and every name on the earth and every name below the earth. And those below the earth were watching what was going on. They had failed miserably to hold him in the ground. He raised up and he brought this exactly what he has said. And now there was a group of people. There was a person. There was a thing on the earth. A like nature. A bride. A wife. In the same way that Eve was born out of season, so was the church born out of season. And the whole world was watching. Here she is, the pinnacle of creation. There she is, the Lamb's bride and wife. Revelation chapter 21 verse 9 says, the, bride, the Lamb's bride and wife has made herself ready for the marriage feast. You are them. You are her. You are her adorned in the beauty of holiness. The purpose of the age. Born out of season. Let me tell you, let me just show you one little, little image. Not in my notes. I'll probably get in trouble for this. But hang with me. Just hang with me for just a moment. This is a manufacturing plant. Smokestack, fire going up, smokestack, fire going up. These are railroad cars, railroad cars coming in, raw materials coming in, raw materials coming in, people coming to work, lots and lots of people coming to work. Oh, they got so many. They, they employ a couple hundred people, a couple thousand maybe, who knows. They got it over here, and it's, just, it's a manufacturing plant. You got it? You understand what I'm saying? And on the other side is a car. What is the purpose of the manufacturing plant? To keep people working? To use coal? To do this? To do that? No, my friends. The purpose of all of this is to produce that. What comes out of this age? A bride. To reign and rule with Christ unto the ages to come. This is an age of preparation. An age in which the Holy Spirit is preparing a people to reign and rule with Christ unto the ages to come. We will reign and rule with Him as kings and priests. You know the scripture. We've been redeemed by the blood. Revelations chapter 5, verse uh, 9 and 10. Kings and priests. As kings, this is the way the Jewish people set up, folks. They had kings and priests. The kings, they handled the secular. The priests, they handled the spiritual. But we are kings and priests. We are kings and priests. We are called to rule upon the earth as kings and priests in the spiritual and in the natural. That's what the Bible says. There is scriptural evidence and a reasonable expectation that the lives of his disciples would witness to Jesus as the Christ of God with the same power and the authority of the indwelling presence or anointing of the Holy Spirit throughout the complete duration of this age of preparation. Now don't go looking for age of preparation in your Bible. I'm giving that to you. I'm naming this thing. From the time he spoke and said, let there be light. Until the time he says, wrap it up, boy. He brings it down out of heaven, a new heaven, a new earth. And he comes down and he doesn't destroy the earth. He makes it all new. And he comes and he abides in Jerusalem, right over it. The new Jerusalem is there to reign and to rule into the ages. That's another study. 
This is absolutely not one piece of scriptural, there is not a, one piece of scriptural evidence that would even suggest that these signs and his power would not continue and even increase as a witness and a testimony of the kingdom of God until his return. There's not a single scripture. There is nothing but the traditions of men and the fear of men and our own arrogance and our own poverty of spirit and mind, our hardness of heart, our dullness of hearing that keep us from obeying. Everything that was lost, listen to me really carefully. Oh, God, can I do it? Okay. Everything that was lost in the fall was restored through the sequence of events of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. His death upon the cross, the work of the grave, and His being resurrected from the dead by His Father. He then ascended into heaven to cleanse the heavenly temple and to place His own blood upon the heavenly altar. He did both. He cleansed, in all, uh, 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 he cleansed a temple that had been defiled by Lucifer. And He cleansed that with His blood. And then He put His blood upon an altar and then He put Himself upon that altar. Sealing the new covenant between himself and the Father. Then he returned and he explained all that had taken place to his disciples for 40 days of awe. After which he reascended into heaven to be seated with his Father until he is sent once again by the Father. The church has been being built, has been being built by Jesus Christ to reign in life and co-rule with him into the ages to come. As kings we reign over secular and social issues. While as priests, we reign over spiritual and creation issues of life. The distinction between secular and sacred has been done away with. The dividing has been done away with. Religion brought it back. The devil brought it back. The devil gave us collars and, and, and temples to worship in. Not God. God took it away. He tore it apart. He took away and made one new man. The distinction between secular and sacred has been done away with in Christ. And he says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Bear with me for those of you who have ends or uttermost or whatever. Just bear with me for a moment. God's going to pour out His Spirit like never before. Now, do you remember a couple weeks ago or maybe last month, I had a graph here with the increase in population on the earth. Any of you remember that? We're at 8.8 .8 million billion people on the planet today. I heard a man the other day. I heard a man the other day. I listened to him. He's a homosexual who is putting his hat into the ring as a presidential candidate. He is currently the mayor of a Midwest city. And he's 37 years old. And here's what he says. He says, I'm thinking about the way the world will be when I'm as old as the president is today. Well, the president is 70. So the man's 37 years old and he's thinking about the way life will be on the planet earth when he's 70. When he's 70, there'll be over 12 billion people on the planet earth. There'll be no more water, no more food, no more land, no more air, but there'll be 12 billion people. What will this world be like? I'm telling you what, God is pouring out a spirit and it will not be held and be not given over to the depravity of human nature. But there is a redeeming people who are coming up. When it says to the end of the earth in Acts 1.8 it should not be applied to the geographical extents of the earth only but also to the duration of time to the end of the age of preparation. See, it's not just until we go to every country, 
every piece of land, every piece of geography, every piece of real estate and get the job done. I'm telling you, God is faithful to the end of the age. Lo, I am with you when? Until the end of the age. The what age? The age of preparation, of preparing a people who are preparing the world for his return as the bride, as a living, breathing, holy, pure bride. My friends, we are at that time right now. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, and then the end shall come. The end. Now, I'm not necessarily speaking about the end of the earth. He's speaking about the end of the age. He's talking specifically to his disciples. They said, when will be the end of the age? He says, this will be the signs of the end of the age. The gospel of the kingdom of God will be preached in all the earth as a witness to every nation. And then the end will come. The end of what? The end of an age. My friends, we have only just begun. The power and authority to declare, display, demonstrate the reality of the kingdom of God was never retracted, never retrieved, never restrained, never restricted by God in any manner or fashion scripturally. Acts 3. Acts 3. This is the last scripture and we'll be done with the class today. Hang with me just a few more minutes. I want you to just, uh, you can open your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. 19 to 21. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. This is what it says. The return of Jesus of, of Christ to the earth is associated with the completion of the restoration of all those things prophesied through the centuries. I'm going to just read it instead of paraphrasing it like that. I'll just read it out of my Bible. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all, all, all His holy prophets since the world began. Every prophetic word must be found true and accomplished. Jesus will remain in heaven until the times of the restoration of all things. And God is restoring the gospel of the kingdom of God now. God is restoring the power, the authority, the majesty of His glory in and among His people now. And we will see it before He comes. There is no escape clause. There is a conquering clause. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. It's not an escape mechanism. It's a conquering mechanism. There must be an end or a finishing of the times of restoration. There are times, not a time of restoration. Times of restoration, which of course included the restoration of Israel as a nation. It includes the restoration of Jerusalem as the capital. It includes the restoration of the West Bank as the property of Israel. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. Times of refreshing may come from the presence. We must become a presence. Saturated people. Nothing short of the presence of God will bring any sort of refreshing. Religion doesn't cut it. Liturgy doesn't get the job done. We need the presence of a living God to open up our understanding, to empower us, equip us, engage us into world transformation to bring the civilization of heaven to earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in Shehalis, in Lewis County, in my life, in my town, as it is even now in heaven, God. And I will not be satisfied until that happens. Amen? Amen. I want to thank you for your time. 
for your patience, for your willingness. And next week, I hope you will join me for what I consider to be the greatest of the Great Commission commandments, and that is the commandment found in John. And I hope to bring to you some revelation of what happened when Jesus was in the grave, what happened when Jesus was ascending into heaven, what happened, and we're going to talk about that because Jesus comes back and then he says something to his disciples. Unlike anything any of the other commandment commissions say. Amen? Thank you. The Lord bless you, keep you, and be with you through this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.